I'm a court interpreter, but I'm also a legal translator. I do about half and half. Uh, my company, Texan Translation, is a family business. It's me, my wife, her twin sister, our three daughters who are in college, and then two employees. And we, um, I do the the interpreting side, and they and they do all the translation side. And so it's a lot of um, court documents. Like um, I will go to deposition and interpret for the Spanish speakers there, and then they have some documents that they're submitting into evidence um, that are in Spanish, and so they'll ask me and my team to translate them. And so if you are interested in uh, the legal translation side of our profession, um, I'm also very interested in, in that, and, and I offer some, some training and blogs and videos too on legal translation. But today we'll be talking about um, interpreting in criminal cases, uh, specifically uh, weapons terminology, and I'd like to I'm going to end, I'll leave the poll open for a few more minutes. For those of you who haven't had a chance to answer it yet, there's a certificate of attendance poll where you put in your email address and your name. Um, yes, thank you for reminding me. I'm going to put up a link here. Uh, these are the four uh, links that might be of interest to you. Uh, the first one is a fundraiser for Refugee Services of Texas. This is my uh, charity of the month that I'm supporting. I like to help out different charities that work with non-English speakers and limited English proficient people. Um, and Refugee Services of Texas is a big one that uh, does a lot of good here around the state. Um, there's also, the second link is to a YouTube video I recorded with a, a friend where we're reading aloud an expert witness testimony. We sort of dra dramatize a forensic expert who's being examined under oath about a weapon used in a crime. And so you can use that for a simultaneous practice or, or for um, consecutive practice by just pausing it. And then the third one is my YouTube channel. Um, if you want to subscribe to that, when these uh, videos get posted, you'll get a notification. And then uh, there's the Texan Translation uh, review page. Um, if you want to do something nice for Texan Translation um, and leave a review saying these guys are amazing. They're my favorite translators in the entire state of Texas, something like that. Um, uh, get, get better soon, Marco, that'd be cool. Um, we're a small family business, and so those reviews make a difference. I'm going to check my chats here real quick. Okay. Uh, Zoom. All right. Uh, if you are joining by phone and you can't see the survey, that's fine. I will get you a certificate of attendance if needed in some other way. If you don't get one when I send them out next week, you can email me back and I'll follow up directly. Um, all right, and I'll be saving this chat afterwards too. So um, sort of uh, to lay the groundwork, we're talking about guns today, and I know that guns are a sensitive and politically charged topic, um, like everything else in today's world. <laughs> And so let's just try to be very objective and just approach this from sort of a scientific perspective of understanding the technology so that we can communicate it effectively in a legal setting. And um, it would help me to know if uh, any of you have a lot of experience with guns um, uh, or no experience. And so if you could just put in the chat, um, if you have, say if you grew up, if you're a country boy like me and you grew up shooting and you had a pick up with a shotgun in the back window like I did. Um, say a lot of experience. If you've never touched a gun in real life, say no experience, and that'll help me to, you know, uh, address your needs appropriately. None, none, none. All right. Some. Okay, good. Uh, when we did this training in person at Tajit four years ago, I, I brought a bunch of guns and passed them around the room and let people try them out. And so it's hard to kind of... Um, get the same hands-on experience with PowerPoints, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, toy guns, good. <laughs> we will get as, as close as we can. Uh, all right, so I'm going to share screen now. Let me just scan through here. Look at this, nice big crowd. Thank you for joining me. Um, I'm gonna share the screen and Make sure that you all can see PowerPoint. Hmm. Moment though.
Word. Show all windows. Okay. If you have too many open, it hides some of the tabs. Okay. So give me a thumbs up if you can see my PowerPoint now. All right. So today we're going to cover um, general types of weapon, the four main categories of a firearm, of firearms, uh, the basic terms that are found on all firearms, and then handguns versus long guns, what action means. Action is a description of the mechanism for loading and unloading a firearm. Uh, ammunition, the parts and types of ammunition. And then famous brands and calibers of firearms that you hear used as nicknames, especially in um, law enforcement testimony. Then a little bit about ballistics testimony from experts. And finally, knives and other smaller handheld weapons that are non-firearms. If you have questions as you go, you're welcome to throw them in the chat. I may not see them right away, but I will have a, a question and answer period at the end. So um, don't worry, I will get, get around to your questions. So first of all, this is a picture from, I think, Mad Max. Uh, just to demonstrate that there are many, many kinds of weapons. Humanity has been extremely creative in designing ways to hurt other people. Um, but we are not going to talk about anything today in this presentation except firearms and edged weapons because those are the two most common type that will come up in a criminal case. And so uh, these are, this is my own uh, division right here. This isn't something you'll find in an official textbook, but I feel that there are four main kinds of firearm that every interpreter should be able to distinguish. And on the left, we have two kinds of handgun, and on the right, two kinds of long gun. And if you are an ex-army drill instructor, sniper, you're going to quibble with my use of terminology because I'm not going to be super precise. Um, in the Army, for example, they use the word gun only to refer to a weapon that's fired by two or more people, and a weapon is a gun fired by one person. Um, but that terminology is unique to the military. In law enforcement, they have their own jargon. Hunters and uh, the shooting sports have their own jargon. And so I'm just going to try to uh, give the most common, broadly accepted terms today. And if you're interested in pursuing the study further, you'll find out that there are um, a lot of uh, ways to split hairs when you get into these precise uh, terms. But in general, on the left, we have two kinds of handguns. And um, you, as you'll probably observe, uh, a handgun is something that can be fired by one hand on the top. Um, there is a type of handgun called a pistol or an automatic, which is short for semi-automatic pistol. On the bottom, we have an example of a revolver. Um, pistols uh, and semi-automatic pistols in particular have been around for 100 years, um, and they're probably the most common type of handgun in the world today. Uh, down on the bottom, revolvers have been around for a couple hundred years, and we sort of associate them with the Wild West and cowboys, but they're still made and they're still used um, in some law enforcement settings and for sports shooting. On the right, uh, the two main kinds of long guns are rifles and shotguns. And as you can probably see, a long gun is longer uh, than a handgun. It's usually made to be fired with both hands and to be braced against the shoulder. And the part that comes out of the back that you brace against your shoulder is called a stock. There are some sort of crossovers and gray areas. There are rifles that are very small called carbines. And there are fully automatic rifles that are very small um, called submachine guns. Um, but in general, a rifle is usually fired with both hands and braced against the shoulder. And it has a longer barrel than a pistol does. Other than that, the pistols and the rifles may fire some of the same size ammunition. Um, there are cartridges and calibers that are common in both pistols and rifles, but in general, rifles will fire a larger bullet with more gunpowder and it'll file, fire it farther and more accurately than a pistol will. And then down in the lower right, a shotgun is shaped kind of like a rifle. This example right here is made out of wood, and so it, it, it's a different style. Um, but both rifles and shotguns can have wood on them and look sort of pretty and antique and fancy, or they can be all black plastic and metal. 
like the rifle shown. Um, but the difference is that a rifle fires a single bullet at a time, and a shotgun generally fires a handful of little round pellets at a time. And um, we'll get into a couple more differences between rifles and shotguns later on. Uh, but these are the four main categories. And if you are taking notes, um, first of all, I'm a former high school teacher, and I was always uh, big on my students taking notes. And so I'm going to harp on that today. I feel like uh, if you have uh, paper and pencil in front of you, um, and you could just sketch out this tic-tac-toe pattern right here and categorize um, the column of handguns and the column of long guns and then the rifles and pistols and the revolvers and shotguns, uh, write it down and maybe make a little tiny sketch just to jog your memory. Um, this will be on the quiz. There are two quizzes coming up. So next we have a sample um, of a an automatic. This is called many things. Um, in, in common slang, it's called an automatic, which is short for a semi-automatic pistol. And it shows um, all the basic features that almost any modern firearm has. And so I hope that you will sketch these out too. It's going to be up for a couple minutes. You should have time to uh, draw the basics. It's not art class. You will not be graded on how pretty your drawing is. But I would like you to have all the words in your notes. Um, so the main parts uh, going from the top left are the front sight. And the front sight uh, teams up with the rear sight so that you can point directly at a target. Um, the front sight is usually a single uh, vertical piece of metal, like uh, picture a shark fin or a mohawk. And then the rear sight is usually sort of a Y shape. And when you're sighting, you're looking between the um, two pieces of the, the rear sight and lining them up with the front sight so that you can um, see where you're pointing. Then we have the barrel. The barrel is just a tube or a pipe that the bullet flies through to make it go straight and to help it um, uh, fly in the right direction. Then you see the bullet, uh, which is part of the cartridge. The bullet is, the, of course, the part that flies out the end. It's usually made out of lead. Uh, the cartridge is sort of like a picture a, a soup can with gunpowder in it. Um, and the bullet uh, sits in the end of the cartridge, and then when you shoot, the gunpowder explodes, or technically it deflagrates, um, but it burns very fast and expands, and the gases push the bullet out the end. Next, you'll see the firing pin. The firing pin is sort of like a nail, and the nail gets pulled back, and then when you pull the trigger, it flies forward, and the tip of the nail hits the back of the cartridge where there's a little tiny bit of high explosive called the primer. And that primer is what sets off the gunpowder. Then in the top right, you'll see there's the rear sight and the hammer. The hammer is kind of like a hammer that you use um, with a hammer and a nail at home. Um, it's going to pull back. And then when it goes flying forward, um, it hits against the back of the firing pin and um, sets off the bullet. And we'll, I'll show you an animation in a minute of all these parts in motion so the interaction will be clearer. Uh, now, down in the lower left, we see the muzzle. The muzzle is just the hole at the end that the bullet comes out of. And you might associate that with the muzzle of a dog. Um, the muzzle of a dog is the, the dangerous part, the hole in the front of the dog's head that it can bite you with. <laughs> and the same thing applies to a gun. Um, sometimes if a firearm is shot at night, like in combat, um, you'll see flashes of fire coming out the end of the muzzle. That's called a muzzle flash and some military weapons will have a special device at the end to try to hide that called a, a flash suppressor um, so that the enemy doesn't see where you're shooting from. Next, uh, in the center and bottom, we have the trigger guard. And that's kind of a loop of metal that goes around the trigger. And that's so that you don't accidentally push the trigger. Like when you're um, putting the handgun back into the, the holster, you don't want the trigger to snag on something and shoot yourself in the foot. And so the trigger guard just forms a mechanical protection around the trigger. Or if you're hunting and you're going through the woods, you don't want a branch snagging on the trigger. And then the trigger itself is the part that you pull to fire. Uh, the magazine is also called, some people call it a clip. I would say magazine is the high register name and clip is the low register name. And, and some purists will dispute uh, the use of clip, but lots of shooters call it that. 
that's just a the part of the firearm that holds the bullets that holds the ammunition um, until you're ready to use them in a in an automatic pistol like this it'll be inside the handle and some rifles and shotguns it's in a tube underneath the barrel and so the magazine there are lots of different designs of magazine and then the grip finally is just the part that you hold on to in a handgun um, it's usually a one-handed grip i'm i'm a lefty and so my handguns i hold with my left hand um, some of them are ambidextrous some of them are only for lefties only for righties or you can get a conversion kit so a lefty can shoot a right-handed um, handgun so those are parts common to almost any firearm though they might be in a different place uh, depending on what kind you're looking at so here it's always challenging to see if videos will play correctly on powerpoints over zoom but I'm gonna give this a try. And here's a little um, cartoon showing how a semi-automatic handgun operates. You should be watching an animation now. Um, if it's not visible on your screen, let me know. Otherwise, I'll assume you're seeing a magazine being pulled out of the back of a handgun. Can you get the fuck out of there? So this is how you load. Uh, magazine or clip field stripping means the basic disassembly of the major components so that you can uh, clean and oil and do routine maintenance it's called field stripping because you can do it out in the field you just have to spread out a, a towel on a picnic bench or something and take it apart it doesn't require any special tools So the blue part is the barrel here on the left, and the opening to the barrel is called the breech. And when the cartridge goes into the breech and sits firmly in place so it's ready to fire, that's called um, chambering. The, the base of the barrel is the chamber, kind of like um, we use the word chamber to mean room, the judges in chambers. Um, the chamber is the room where the cartridge sits until it's ready to fire. The near end of the barrel closer to the shooter is the breech and the far end is the muzzle. And now through the laws of physics, the blowback, the pressure from the explosion both pushes the bullet out the front and it pushes the slide back, which operates the action and brings the old cartridge out and tosses it on the ground and then brings a new one into place to be fired again. So every time you pull the trigger, um, the, a bullet comes out the end, and that's called a semi-automatic action. People call it an automatic handgun, um, because, and, but that's just short for semi-automatic. Um, there's another action called fully automatic, and you see some handguns, like especially, um, I watch uh, TV shows about the cartels, um, and sometimes they'll have a fully automatic handgun and it's this size, but you pull the trigger once and hold it down and it'll fire um, however many rounds, 19 rounds or however many is in the magazine. But most handguns this size are semi-automatic 
meaning you pull the trigger one time for each shot. Yes, Francisco, this is, you don't have to write it all down. You can download this um, presentation um, from, the, from the link and review it later, from the Dropbox link. What is, what's the typical load for a semi-automatic? Um, Six. A, a handgun like this um, may have up to 19 shots. Um, anywhere from, I would say, 8 to 19 is typical. Um, if it's 45 caliber, then it won't have as many because that's a larger cartridge. If it's 9 millimeter, then they can pack it in um, uh, in, a, in two columns, and you can fit more in there. So there, somebody asked about the little levers. There are lots of levers and buttons on this, and they do different things. Um, some of them might be the safety to keep it from firing until you're ready. Some of them uh, might be to uh, lock the slide back or to release the slide so that you can take it off and field strip it. And each manufacturer and each model of handgun is different. And so um, as an interpreter, you wouldn't have to keep track of what all the little parts are and where they are. But when an expert names them, um, you should be familiar with uh, what it's called in your other working language. And so usually as an interpreter, uh, an expert witness is going to be speaking in English on the stand and I'm going to be interpreting to a defendant in Spanish in my case. Um, or if there's a, a Spanish speaking uh, witness on the stand talking about um, something uh, weapon related then I might be interpreting into English for the uh, attorneys, uh, for the prosecutor. Or the defense attorney and so um, depending on your language combination it may be more important to know the terminology and uh, be more familiar with it in one language or the other but i won't get into the weeds on that right now let's stick to terminology so that was a semi-automatic handgun also called a pistol um, i don't know i didn't catch what brand that was it might have been a glock glock is the most popular uh, model of uh, handgun in the United States right now. Um, you'll also uh, see a lot of uh, Berettas. Um, those are still big. Um, I think most law enforcement is carrying Glocks now and the military, last I checked, the, the military was still using a Beretta handgun. So now we have, uh, going back to cowboy days, uh, we have a revolver and uh, revolvers accomplish the same thing as an automatic, but using a uh, different mechanism. Instead of the magazine being in the grip, um, it's in this barrel-shaped device called the cylinder in the middle, and it turns every time you pull the trigger and lines up a new cylinder with the barrel. So I'll play a little animation of that. Oh, and this one has music. A revolver is a repeating firearm that uses a cylinder that contains multiple chambers and at least one barrel for firing. The revolver for this example is double action, meaning that the hammer is cocked back when pulling the trigger, and once the trigger is pulled all the way back, the hammer is released to hit the firing pin. Let's look at the firing sequence. The trigger lever pushes the hammer backward. As it moves backward, the hammer compresses a metal spring in the handle. The spring showed is a coiled spring. Uncoiled tension springs are also used. At the same time, a pawl attached to the trigger pushes on a ratchet to rotate the cylinder. This positions the next breech chamber in front of the gun barrel. Another pawl lodges in a small depression on the cylinder. This stops the cylinder in a particular position so it is perfectly lined up with the barrel. When the trigger lever is pushed all the way back, it releases the hammer. The compressed spring drives the hammer forward. The firing pin on the hammer extends through the body of the gun and hits the primer. The primer explodes, igniting the propellant. The propellant burns, releasing a large volume of gas. And the gas pressure drives the bullet down the barrel. The gas pressure also causes the cartridge case to expand, temporarily sealing the breech. All the expanding gas pushes forward rather than backward.
So one key term that he used that you should add to your notes is propellant. Propellant is what we usually call gunpowder or smokeless powder. And um, it, propellant is just a generic term for any kind of um, powder that explodes or, or burns quickly and propels the bullet forward. I'm looking at the, the, the uh, questions in the chat here. Um, yes, you would leave the, the brand name of the firearm in the original language like any proper names, but a lot of these mechanical parts will have a more accurate translation in your target language. So those are two different kinds of handguns. Uh, next, we're moving on to long guns, starting with a rifle. This is what you would probably consider a deer rifle. And um, the main parts, uh, starting from the far left, are the stock. And that's what you brace it against your shoulder with um, to keep it steady and to also control the recoil. And if it's a powerful rifle, then it's going to kick hard against your shoulder. You might come back from a day at the shooting range with a bruised shoulder because of all the, the pressure hitting you. Or if it's a small rifle like a 22, then you won't even notice the kick. The safety can be anywhere on the rifle. Um, sometimes it's operated by your thumb. The safety is just a little uh, catch that you keep engaged until you're ready to fire it. Uh, the bolt handle in this case is the, the blue circle there in the middle. Um, this is a bolt action rifle, and that means every time you're going to fire, you uh, take your, in my case, since I'm a lefty, I take my right hand and move the bolt up, um, back, forward, and down. And um, that uh, ejects the spent casing, the spent brass, or the empty cartridge that's already been fired, and then it reloads a new one from the magazine into the chamber and cocks the iron pin back um, to be ready to fire again. The bolt is that silver mechanism in the middle that um, pushes the cartridge into the chamber. The chamber, again, is uh, the rear end of the barrel where the cartridge sits until it's ready to fire. The sight, in this case, um, there's a front sight and a rear sight. Uh, this, is, uh, the, this is the shape of rifle that you usually use for hunting deer and other large game. And so a lot of these rifles will have a scope on the top, and a scope is a little telescope with the crosshair in it that helps you aim. But almost all rifles also have what's called open sights or iron sights. And here we have an example of open sights or iron sights, and that's just the simple blade in front and the sort of Y shape in back for pointing in the right direction. Um, then in the lower left, we have the butt. The butt is just the padded end of the stock that pushes against your shoulder. Uh, the trigger guard and the trigger, the same as we've seen before. The magazine in this case is kind of invisible. You can see the coming out the bottom of the wood stock. Um, all the wood part is called the stock. And coming out the bottom there, um, there's a little bit of a black that you can barely see. That's the, the base plate of the magazine. Um, this has a very small magazine. It probably holds three or four shots, um, and it's all inside, um, hidden from view there. The forestock is the front end, um, where your front hand is going to be holding it, or sometimes you'll be resting it on a rest to steady it. Um, so the forestock is uh, the front half, and the stock um, is the back half, and the whole thing together can be referred to as the stock. Okay. And then um, we have the barrel and the muzzle. The muzzle, like on a dog, is a tip where the bullet comes out. Looking at the chat, revolvers like a Smith & Wesson. OK, how many bullets? All right. Rifles have double barrels. Yes, some are double barreled, correct. So here we have all different kinds of rifles. I just pulled an assortment off of Google image search. And uh, the first one is a deer rifle, like in the previous screen, with a big scope on it. Uh, the bigger the scope is, probably the higher powered the rifle it is and the farther away you can um, acquire your target. Uh, the second one is an AR-15. The AR-15 is the most popular rifle in the United States right now. There are, I, re I read some amazing statistics that's like, I don't remember how many million AR-15s um, in circulation now. It's based on the M16, which was the 
U.S. Army's rifle back in the Vietnam era, and uh, most AR-15s are uh, 223 caliber. Um, the AR-15 here is also the quintessential assault rifle, um, which is the subject of great political controversy. And a, an assault rifle generally means a military-style semi-automatic rifle, um, often with a high-capacity magazine. This magazine right here, it's probably uh, holds 30 rounds, and you'll see that it sort of uh, curves forward. Um, the curve in a, in, a, in a long magazine is because the, um, the bullets are pointed, and so they take up less space at the front end than they do in the back. And in order to make more efficient use of the space, the engineers have um, curved the magazine forward, and that helps them feed in smoothly. An assault rifle, and it, it's an imprecise term, but it's also generally um, nothing but uh, metal and plastic, and it's uh, designed to be impervious to the elements and um, be able to take a beating out in the rain and the mud and keep on working, while a deer rifle with a wooden stock um, needs uh, more tender loving care and, and linseed oil and uh, cleaning and um, oiling to keep it in good condition because it uses more traditional materials. Then in the lower left-hand corner, we have a black powder rifle. Um, this is also a muzzle loader. This is uh, what was used in the 1700s, uh, 1800s. And um, a muzzle loader will fire one shot at a time, and it takes a minute or two to reload it because it doesn't have a magazine. Well, the, the magazine is hanging from your, your waist um, and doesn't use cartridges. It uses um, uh, powder. You put in black powder, and you put in a separate primer, and you put in um, cotton wadding, and then you put in the bullet, and then you jam it all down with a ramrod from the end to get it ready to fire. And so it's a, a much uh, simpler and slower uh, technology. In the top right-hand corner is an example of a sniper, a sniper rifle. Um, sniper rifles almost always have a large scope at the top. They're often bolt action rather than semi-automatic. This one in the example is semi-automatic, but bolt action are considered to be more accurate um, because of differences in the, in the chambering mechanism. And they are slower, um, but they lend themselves to uh, higher powered cartridges and uh, longer range. Uh, next is um, a Kalashnikov rifle, uh, which was uh, first designed in, by a Russian engineer named Kalashnikov um, uh, maybe 80 years ago, and has since become probably the most common rifle on the planet in many different variations, different models. Now it's made in many different countries. Um, in Spanish, these are sometimes called cuerno de chivo, which means uh, goat horn, um, because of the, the curving shape of the magazine. Um, if you are interpreting in a trial and somebody in Spanish calls it a cuerno de chivo, don't call it a, a goat horn in English because that, that it, the idiom doesn't exist in English. Um, you can assume that they're talking about uh, an AK, one of the AKs, there's AK-47s, there's AK-74s, there's AKs, all different numbers that come after that. And so I would probably um, interpret that as an assault rifle, not knowing which kind they meant. Uh, next, we have a simple uh, low-end 22 rifle. 22 is the most common caliber in the world. It's small, it's cheap, it costs a couple pennies to each time you fire a 22 versus maybe 50 cents or a dollar or five dollars for some of these higher calibers. And then finally is an air rifle, also called a pellet gun. Um, some other, uh, this is not a firearm, it's uh, fires compressed air um, and some other uh, things that look like firearms in that category are airsoft and uh, paintball guns, and those are used in different sports where people actually shoot at each other and have war games. And so occasionally that might be uh, mentioned in witness testimony if somebody's been shot by an air rifle. A high-powered air rifle can be dangerous, can even be fatal, um, but it's not technically a firearm because there's no fire involved. There's no gunpowder that burns. So. This next video is going to demonstrate how a lever action rifle operates. And these were big in the, the Wild West, and they're uh, less common now. But it is one of the uh, important actions that you should know the name of.
So as you can see, the in this kind of rifle and in a lot of um, more traditional rifles, the magazine is a tube underneath the barrel where there's a, a long line of cartridges. And as each one is fired, it's peeled off the back and pushed up into the chamber, fired, and then ejected out the top. So questions in the chat, what are machine guns? Um, a machine gun is sort of the uh, low register slang expression for a fully automatic uh, rifle. And um, you could have a fully automatic submachine gun or even a fully automatic machine pistol, which are unusual, but it means that every time you pull the trigger and hold the trigger down, it'll keep on firing until the magazine's entirely empty. Are all shotguns rifles? No, very few shotguns are rifles. Um, a rifle means that the inside of the barrel has spiral grooves cut all the way down to give a spinning motion to the bullet as it leaves the rifle. Um, a shotgun almost always is smooth bore, meaning that there are no rifle grooves. And when you fire a shotgun, um, all the little pellets just go straight down the barrel and they don't, they aren't given any spin. The AR-15 is not an assault rifle. Yes. Um, assault rifle, Peter, is not even, assault rifle is a media term that was invented for political reasons. It, it, there's no good definition of an assault rifle. It's sort of how the speaker wants to characterize a firearm. And AR does stand for Armalite Rifle, correct? Okay, so those were rifles. And uh, now in comparison, we're gonna look at the fourth of the main categories, which is shotguns. And you'll see a shotgun is shaped kind of like a rifle. It's got a stock, it's got a butt, it's got a grip and a trigger guard and a trigger and a safety somewhere. Um, it has a muzzle and a barrel, um, the same as a rifle. Um, the, the main differences with shotguns is that um, the, the cartridges are bigger, and rather than being called a cartridge, it's called a shotgun shell, or a shot shell for short. And rather than just being one bullet in it, um, most of them have a bunch of little BBs in it um, called uh, shot or shot shells. And depending on what you're hunting, if you're hunting little birds like doves, then they might be... Um, there might be 30 tiny little BBs in there. If you're hunting um, big birds like ducks, there might just be um, 10 uh, larger beads in there. If you're hunting deer, in certain jurisdictions, you can only hunt deer with a shotgun because um, they don't go as far in the woods and it's safer for other hunters that are in the distance versus using a rifle. And so you have to use buckshot and there might just be three or four big um, spheres of ammunition in the shotgun shell. But um, so the big difference is our shotguns have um, smooth barrels on the inside. They're smooth bore. There's no rifling. And they generally fire multiple projectiles in each shot. There are some exceptions. You can have a rifle barrel on a shotgun, and you can fire a single slug through there, in which case the shotgun is basically just a big, fat rifle. But that's, that's an exception. So these are examples of some typical shotguns. On the top, we have an over-under double-barreled shotgun. There are also side-by-side -side double-barreled shotguns. And often, um, those will, the two barrels will be for the same um, gauge. Instead of caliber with shotguns, you have gauges. So maybe they'll both be 12-gauge barrels, um, but they'll, um, the, the muzzle will be slightly different shaped so that if people are hunting duck, for example, you fire the first shot when the duck is close by, and then the second shot um, as it gets farther away, and, and the, the ballistics are different so that you can uh, be accurate over a greater range the other time. But basically, it's just so you get two shots out of a single um, traditional shotgun. In the lower left, we have a single shot break open shotgun. And um, break open means that uh, when you want to reload it, you um, push a lever and swing the uh, front half down and then you can see into the chamber and you take your shotgun shell and you slip into the chamber and then you pop it back up and cock it and it's ready to fire. And so after you fire, then you have to do the same thing again. You push a lever, open it up, pull out the empty shotgun shell, put it in your pocket because we don't litter, and then put in a new one and then close it up and cock it and it's ready to fire. 
So a single shot, break open shotgun. This is my first shotgun I got as a 12 year old with a single shot break open. And if you live in the country in Texas, like I did, <laughs> that's considered a, a kid's shotgun, an entry level shotgun. Um, it's uh, slow, the mechanism is simple, they're inexpensive, and um, it uh, is intended, they're used mainly for hunting um, varmints um, or small game like um, doves and rabbits. And then finally, in the lower right, we have a military style or paramilitary shotgun might be called a riot gun, a riot shotgun, a breaching shotgun, or a combat shotgun. Um, breaching meaning um, for taking down doors, like if a SWAT team is trying to get through a door, um, sometimes they'll use a shotgun to shoot off the hinges and then kick it down. Um, this is a has a folding stock. I believe this one, you can't see it, um, but the stock folds out of the way so that you can put it inside of a rucksack and it's more portable. Um, you can use it. Um, with just your two hands and no um, stock folded out, or you can fold the stock out for greater control and stability. So those are three uh, general shapes of um, shotgun. And I see some discussion of Spanish terminology in there. Uh, there is uh, also a Spanish glossary in the in the Dropbox folder. If anybody got on late, um, I do have a Dropbox folder with the handouts for this class. Here's a little animation showing um, the inside of a shotgun in action. This is not a pump action shotgun, um, but rather a semi-automatic shotgun. Those are the two typical um, actions for modern shotguns. Either you pump it to reload and cock it, or, you, or it's semi-automatic, and each time you fire the, the blowback, the inertia operates a mechanism. Okay, so it's time for your first quiz. And these are the words uh, that we'll be using. I'm gonna read them out loud to make sure I've gone over all of them. Hammer, revolver, smokeless, smokeless powder, fully automatic, rifle, pump, barrel, muzzle, magazine, guard, stock, sight, safety, bullet, and chamber. Yes, I believe we've covered those. So I'm going to stop sharing. And if you have the uh, quiz one on paper, um, we're going to take like just a few minutes to uh, fill that out. And I will put it up on the screen in case you are unable to get to that for some reason. Um, you can also look at it on here. But it's a crossword puzzle because I like crossword puzzles. And I think in professional adult training, you need more puzzles, not just lecture, lecture, lecture all the time. So share screen. Here's what it looks like. What the heck is that? Crossword puzzle? Yes. I don't like crossword puzzles. I never done them well. Okay. Francisco, <laughs> no. I am no. officially excusing you from the crossword puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Go get a cup of coffee and come back in a few.
I've just put the link in the chat again if you don't have the handouts. These also came by email yesterday. <laughs> some of you love crossword puzzles, some of you hate them. Oh well. Takes all kinds. Somebody is filling it out on the screen. I didn't even know you could do that in Zoom. Cool, Paolo. You're educating me. <laughs> I, think, I think if you go to view options, there's an option to annotate and then oh, you can yeah. do a lot of fun stuff stamp i'm pretty sure there's a better option yeah i, I can probably input text instead of struggling to write with the mouse <laughs> all right well this is just a little break here um in the interest of time i'm going to say please uh Go through that quiz as you as you prefer um, when you have time. If you're interested, it's just for fun to see if you've uh, come away with some of these main terms so far. Um, but we're going to, and the answers are in the PowerPoints, which you can get from that uh, Dropbox download. By the way, the Dropbox files are just going to be there for a week, and so if you're going to want those handouts, please. Uh, download them today so that you won't come up with the uh, file missing warning when you go in a couple of weeks and looking for them. All right. So give me a thumbs up if you can see the PowerPoint again. Is it up? Did I do it right? Cool. So next we have the concept of action. Action means the mechanism by which the cartridge gets into the chamber and back out again. And the main kinds of action, and I've mentioned all of these briefly already, are semi-automatic, fully automatic, bolt action, lever action, pump action, and break open. Semi-automatic is probably the most common one in modern firearms. You pull the trigger once and one bullet comes out. Fully automatic means you hold the trigger down and all the bullets come out. Selective fire, it's sort of a, an, um, a hybrid. Selective fire means you push the switch one way and it's semi-automatic, and you push the switch the other way and it's fully automatic, and you can do it either way. And those are generally just uh, military rifles um, that you're able to fire on fully automatic. Bolt action um, is often a sniper rifle or a deer rifle, and you have to go ch -ch 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 between each shot. You move a bolt up, back, forward, and down, and that ejects the spent cartridge and it puts a new cartridge into the chamber. Lever action is the same idea, except instead of moving a bolt, you move a handle down underneath, down and up, down and up, and you cycle that between each shot. Pump action, um, kind of like a trombone, uh, with your front hand, you have to slide it forward and slide it back um, to chamber a new round. Chambering a round is a, sort of a low register way of saying um, operating the, the mechanism, operating the action. It means um, putting a new cartridge into the chamber, chambering a round. And then break open, um, usually a shotgun, uh, means that you swing the front half down so that you can see into the chamber and put a cartridge in by hand. Ammunition, this is a handy picture showing the, the wide range of um, ammunition sizes and colors and shapes. And there are probably, I don't, I don't know how many um, kinds of ammunition there are in the world, but at least a couple hundred. And so um, all of them, what they have in common is there's sort of a, a can-shaped base called the casing. It's usually made out of brass. In the case of shotguns, it's made out of plastic with a brass bottom. Um, the top part is called the bullet or the projectile. Um, some, some people will call it the slug. Um, in the case of a shotgun, it might be called a rifled slug. Um, Cartridges are also called rounds. Round is sort of the, the slang for cartridge. 
Um, gunpowder goes on the inside. It's not packed tight with gunpowder. It's sort of loose because there has to be some air in there to combine with the powder. Um, it's actually uh, smokeless powder is a more accurate term than gunpowder. You'll also hear the term cordite. Cordite was a brand of smokeless powder a while back. And then the primer is just a little circle in the bottom. Um, that's an explosive charge that's sensitive to impact. And when the hammer hits against or the firing pin hits against the primer, that's what sets it off. And so um, the ammunition uh, is described in different ways. Sometimes a uh, certain type of cartridge will be described by the manufacturer, by the number of millimeters long it is, by the number of millimeters wide it is, by how many grains of weight the, the bullet weighs. And so there's, there's a whole world of complication that gets into the naming of ammunition. And we're not going to delve into that today. But we are going to watch a little animation of what happens when you um, set off a cartridge, uh, what's going on on the inside. That says non-toxic primer. Can you this too small to read on your screen? There's the firing pin up close, hitting against the silver circle in the middle. That's the outside of the primer, the part you can see. and the explosion forcing the bullet out the end of the barrel. So cartridges and shot shells are basically the same thing. On the left, we have an example of probably the most popular cartridge in the world, a nine millimeter Luger. And um, just an example of the complications of um, naming uh, ammunition, a nine millimeter Luger is also called nine millimeter NATO is also called Nine by 19 millimeter, also called nine millimeter parabellum. There are many different names for the same kind of cartridge, and yet each manufacturer will have a slightly different version of it. And then there are other nine millimeters that are not interchangeable, like a nine millimeter Markov is a is a another a cartridge that also measures nine millimeters across, but the case is a different size, and so you can't use them interchangeably in the same weapon. A weapon will be chambered for one type of cartridge and not for another. And it might almost fit in the other one, but if you tried to fire in there, maybe it's overpowered or maybe it'll get jammed because it wasn't designed to the precise tolerances of that uh, chamber of that um, slide and action and mechanism. So on the left, you see a cutaway of a nine millimeter cartridge and you can see that instead of gunpowder, it's more like a little rods, uh, rod shape of uh, smokeless powder. And then on the right is a cutaway of a shotgun shell uh, we have both a uh, buckshot and buckshot are all the little uh, shiny balls on the left um, versus on the right is a slug and a slug is that big fat giant bullet that you can shoot out of a shotgun um, that makes the shotgun act in effect like a uh, rifle um, rather than a traditional shotgun with lots of little pieces of shot but basically both have a primer at the bottom and gunpowder in the middle and then some kind of projectile at the top Next in uh, firearms testimony, you'll sometimes hear about these accessories mentioned, a sling, holster, cartridge belt, scope, bipod, flash suppressor, silencer, suppressor, and laser sight. And briefly, the sling is the thing that you um, use to hold the rifle or the shotgun over your shoulder. It looks like a belt attached to both ends of a long gun. A holster is a little pocket that you can put a handgun in um, either on your waist or um, on your shoulder. A cartridge belt or a bandolier is a belt that has a bunch of little loops on it for putting in shotgun shells or other um, ammunition. A scope, um, as I showed earlier, is like a telescope with crosshairs mounted on the top of a rifle. A bipod are two little legs that can swing out at the end of a rifle, usually a sniper rifle, um, to give you a rest and to hold it steady. Um, so that you can aim more carefully for a long distance shot. A flash suppressor hides the fire coming out of the end of the muzzle at night so enemy troops won't see you. And a flash suppressor is not to be confused with a sound suppressor. A suppressor or a silencer um, is the thing that's screwed on the end of this pistol down at the bottom um, that uh, muffles the noise of the shot. It doesn't 
completely eliminate it, but it makes it quieter so your enemy in combat can't hear where you're shooting from. And then the laser sight is like a laser pointer you play with a cat with, except it's uh, mounted on the underside of a handgun and helps the shooter aim um, because theoretically wherever that red spot is hitting is where the bullet will hit. So, um, all right, we're just barely going to finish on time. And then don't worry, I'll stay as long as uh, you have questions. I will get around to those. Um, nicknames, uh, when you're listening to experts and police officers testify, often they will just refer offhand to a firearm either by the manufacturer or by the caliber. And so the most common calibers of handgun um, cartridges are 22, 9 mil, 357, 38 special, 380, 40, 44, and 45. And there are also rifles and carbines, which are small rifles that are chambered for most of those rounds. Uh, rifles are often 22, that's the, the tiny one, um, 5.56 millimeter, 7.62 millimeter, 30 out six. Those are some of the popular calibers of rifle, and those are arranged uh, from the smallest down to the largest. Um, 30 out six is a caliber that's used for things like uh, deer hunting and other large game. And then there are, there are 100 other rifle calibers that you might come across. And then finally, shotguns. Most shotguns in the world are 12 gauge. That's sort of the standard um, shot shell size. Uh, there's a smaller one, uh, which is 20 gauge, and an even smaller one, which is 410. And, and these are idiosyncratic because um, with calibers, as the number gets bigger, the bullet gets bigger. With um, shotguns, as the number gets bigger, the size gets smaller. And it has to do with the archaic system for gauges being the size of a lead ball that can fit into the barrel. Um, the weight of that ball, it's a different system than for calibers. Calibers is just fractions of an inch or millimeters. It's the millimeters uh, width of the, um, of the projectile. And so 410 is a caliber that's used for shotguns while other shot shells are measured in gauge. And it's just a, it's a messy, complicated system and you don't have to master it. You should just be aware that caliber and gauge are the two systems that we use for describing the width of the projectile fired by any firearm. And next, these are the all the popular manufacturers of firearms in the world. Uh, most commonly, you'll hear Glocks, Colts, uh, Ruger, Smith & Wesson, um, maybe Winchester, H&K. And so uh, a police officer testifying might say, um, I, fired my, I fired my Glock. And you would have to, you would interpret that as Glock because that's what the officer said. Um, but you would be thinking, um, I understand that Glock is short for a um, semi-automatic handgun manufactured by Glock, which is a company in Austria um, that makes um, law enforcement firearms. When an expert witness gets on the stand, it gets complicated fast. And so I've included um, a, a recording for you to practice on with lots of these uh, uh, terms. Uh, ballistics is the science of what the bullet does as it's flying through the air. A comparison microscope is what the ballistic expert will use to compare the little tiny markings on two different bullets, a uh, sample bullet that's been fired in the lab versus the one recovered at the crime scene. The grooves in the lands are something that you can see in the cross section of a rifled barrel, um, which are patterns cut into the barrel to give the bullet a spiral spin as it flies. And overall, that uh, pattern is called rifling. And a rifle is called a rifle because the inside of a rifle barrel is rifled. It has been cut with this pattern. In the old days, 200 years ago, rifles um, weren't rifled like in the days of black powder. Um, they hadn't come up with this technology yet, and so they were much less um, accurate because the bullet didn't spin as it flew. Sort of like when you throw a football, uh, if you throw a spiral and, and make the football spin, then it'll go straighter and farther. Experts will also talk about shot, um, the little beads that come out of shotgun versus slug. 
if there's a single large bullet in the shotgun. Striations are tiny marks on the surface of the ammunition, um, which help identify, a, to match a bullet up to a certain barrel. Uh, trajectory is the path of the projectile as it flies through the air and is affected by things like uh, elevation and, and wind. And then wadding is paper or plastic uh, material that's used inside of a shotgun shell to separate the shot from the smokeless powder. And after you fire a shotgun, if you look down on the ground in front of you, um, there will be a, a, a shot um, a wadding lying there and it doesn't travel very far because it's so light. Maybe it'll fly out six feet ahead of the shotgun. Okay, so there's also a short section on knives here. Since we've already been going at this an hour, I'm going to just assign this for homework. Uh, learn the general types of knives that might be used in a crime and some of the terminology. Um, and those are knife companies. So um, main takeaways on firearms. I want you to remember um, that handguns consist of automatics, which is short for semi-automatic pistol and revolvers. Automatics are much more common uh, these days. And long guns consist mainly of rifles and shotguns. And um, long guns are designed to be fired with two hands and your shoulder, while handguns are designed to be fired with one hand and are much more concealable. There are laws, um, more laws affecting handguns because they are more prone to be used in crime because they're concealable. And um, finally, all of these parts of a typical handgun you should know and be able to interpret quickly into your other working language because they will likely come up in any um, expert testimony involving a firearm. So this concludes my um, lecture portion of the presentation and I will be circling back around your questions in the chat but for those of you who have to get off now I don't have time to stay on. I'm going to just put my links up here again. Um, there's a fundraiser for Refugee Services of Texas. If you make a donation, put text and translation in there because we're trying to track how many, how much money we're able to raise through this webinar series. Um, there's a 30-minute recording of me and another friend pretending to be an attorney questioning a forensics um, expert um, taken from an actual court transcript. Um, there's our YouTube channel where this video will be posted when we're done. And if you want to leave a review for uh, my translation company, my little family business here, that'd be awesome. Um, there will be a recording available on Monday, yes, and I will email all attendees with the link. You're very welcome, everybody. I'm going to scroll up now and try to catch up with the questions. Now, I know some questions were coming out while I was talking. Autopsy report presentation. Yes, um, Dr. Ray Romero um, mentioned his autopsy report presentation. Some of you were here maybe two months ago when he taught the webinar, and that's um, now posted on my YouTube channel. You can go back, and he taught about um, terminology and concepts that come up in autopsies, um, which are also go hand in hand with this topic. And so I would recommend that you scroll back down and find his video and watch that if you missed it. The only thing that I feel you missed was the rimfire. Yes, rimfire. Thank you. Uh, do you want to explain rimfire to us, Miguel? Yeah, rather than, rather than having a little capsule that uh, uh, that is struck by the hammer in the center of the cartridge, the rimfire, which is basically the 22 cartridge, uh, has that same thing, but it's on the inside perimeter of the casing. So the hammer will actually strike the edge of the cartridge. And those cartridges are not reusable versus the center fire, which are reusable because you can pull out that primer and put a new one in there uh, to use that cartridge again. Yes, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, I see a question about the email. Yes, the email that I sent yesterday, if you didn't get it, those are the same files as in the Dropbox attachment I put on here. Yes, there was a lot of information, but I hope you'll be able to Hold on to the slides as a reference, maybe make some flashcards based on the terminology and, and practice it. And some people are putting up their answers to the quiz here, it looks like. Good job. Um, sling in this context. On that. Oh, I don't remember. Um, did anybody 
prepare a copy of the terms in Chinese, Portuguese, Thai, Burmese, Vietnamese, any of the other languages that you would like to share with your, your colleagues who are on the call. I only have Spanish. Um, I will be doing another webinar next Saturday if you're interested. I've prepared um, Portuguese and Chinese materials for that. Um, I haven't gotten any people signing up from other languages yet, so I haven't um, come up with. I have to hire translators for each of the languages to, to prepare the materials. And so I have to get people signing up for the webinar to, to, in order to hire the translators. And so those are the only two languages we've got going so far. But if you have materials you'd like to share and you give them to me, I can, I can share them with the group too. Okay, scrolling down. And you're welcome. All right. Questions? All right. Um, I do have a book on this topic. Um, e. Burkana is a, is a company in Houston that publishes uh, interpreter training materials. And Ida Trabing, the, the owner, and I published a book a few years ago all about firearms terminology and weapons and Spanish glossary. And so I think uh, there is a link to that in the email that I sent out if you're like really into it. If you're one of these people who loves hard copy, physical glossaries that you can put on a shelf, um, that's, that's a big one, very detailed. I would like to add, if I may, yes. that for those of you that have the Acevo book, The Interpreter's Companion, by Holly Mickelson. There is pages from 125 to 170 on all types of glossaries and terminology, including weapons in Spanish, okay, for you to know. So if you have that book, you will be able to find this information there as well. In yeah. addition to drugs, uh, also other medical profanities, uh, legal terminology, and everything else to complement this presentation. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful book. I I carried it with me my first couple of years in the courtroom. That's why it's supposed to be the companion. <laughs> Appropriately named. She's yes, yes indeed. Thank she, you. Holly Mickelson is my hero. She is so, indeed. So as you log off, and I'm not trying to kick anybody out, but just so you know, as you log off, Zoom will put up a closing poll. Um, and I hope you'll take a minute to answer those questions and also confirm those of you who want a certificate of attendance, um, confirm the email address that you'll be sending it to. And please use the same email address um, each time. Um, people who have multiple email addresses are confusing for me. I, I, I want to make sure I get everybody the right certificate to the right person. So uh, any other questions about weapons? I am at your utter disposal and happy to answer. This is your big chance to ask the Texas farm kid everything you've always wanted to know about guns. <laughs> Son of a Washington State farm kid, grandson of a Wisconsin farm kid. We spent a lot of time shooting cans out in the field. Uh, yes, um, Sheila, we were going to do one with knives, but I ran out of time. This, the knife one just got squeezed in at the end. It's not a separate presentation. It's just me taking too, too long on the, on the guns. I'm sorry. Uh, Dana, the exit poll should show us when you close out of Zoom. And somebody put the link that they said to the Holly Mickelson book. Thank you. It's a good one. You shot your first 22 and you're five years old. I think you beat me, Susanna. <laughs> I'm, I, was, I was at least six. Share the Thai language. Do you see in the chat? Excuse me? I share for the vocabulary or the weapon and also a little bit to the military also on the chat. I try to send it. I'm not sure that you guys. Oh, yes. Yes, you I see, got right? it. Let me, okay. let me try to open that up. That's um, Thai translations of the terms? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. For those. You are great. You are awesome. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I will hold on to this and 
share with other Thai interpreters. Wow, that is very comprehensive. I appreciate that. And if if any of you who work in other languages put together a um, a version of my my handout there in your language later on, uh, I'll try to and you can send it to me, email it to me, and I'll try to pass it along to the other people who work in the same language. I just wanted to make a comment. Yes. It shows you have a, you have been a teacher before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's very very clear. <laughs> I, that means a lot to me. I, I, I was a teacher. My parents were teachers. My wife was a teacher. Her parents were teachers. I, I grew up surrounded by teachers and, and it, education is very important to me. Your explanations are very clear, very simple and clear. Thank you, Marco. I, that you, you made my day. <laughs> Marco, this time we won't shoot the messenger. No <laughs> unintended. <laughs> Thank you. Marco, thank you very much for your presentation. I know uh, it was wonderful. Uh, very expedi expeditiously done. My pleasure, Miguel. And I, I mentioned this last time, if any of you have a, a specialty like, like this, for me, I, I, I spent a lot of time on guns. I know about guns, but if you have a specialty that, that you are uniquely skilled to present at and you, you think it'd be fun to teach a class, um, I just don't know how to set it up, get with me and I can set it up. I can host it and you can you can do the lesson. And probably whatever your little niche is, there are other interpreters out there who would be fascinated to learn about it. And they're just uh, wishing that somebody would would set up a presentation. You never know. You never know what you know that other people wish they they knew until you until you put it out there. Marco, I came in late. You probably shared this earlier about sawed off shotguns seems like a lot of crimes are committed uh, sawed off shotguns and the legality and all that no I, it didn't come up but i'd be glad to comment on it um uh, a shotgun by law can only be a certain uh, minimum barrel length i don't remember what it is like 14 18. inches long 18 18 okay um you cannot buy a shotgun that's under 18 inches um but if you have a shotgun and you want to commit a crime with it and you want to hide it under your trench coat, you, you buy a hacksaw at the hardware store and you saw it off at 12 inches or six inches and you make a little tiny shotgun out of it and you saw off the stock as well and, and make a pistol grip. And sometimes you'll see these in movies and it's basically a, a tiny, a tiny shotgun in the shape of a, of a handgun. Um, and those are illegal. Um, and they are uh, very concealable and they are only good at close range because the barrel is so short that the shot immediately starts spreading out. And if you try to shoot it at something that's, say, 20 yards away, all of the shot will spread out before it even reaches the target and it'll be inaccurate. But if you're trying to commit a crime against somebody who's right in front of you, then it's an extremely dangerous weapon because it's so powerful and it, you don't have to aim it. You just have to point it generally in the direction of, of the target and it spreads out and it'll kill anybody in a large area that's very close to you. And so sawed off shotgun um, is, a, is a general term for a, uh, an amateur, amateurly modified shotgun that's used in, you know, used in crimes. Thank you. Sure. How about a seminar on firearms in Austin? Yes, um, we we did that a few years ago. Um, they let me take real guns to the hotel. Um, you know, the world's changed in the last four years. I don't know if they would approve that anymore. And I'm not sure I would want to do that anymore. Um, but in, in the right venue, you know, on private property or something, um, I would still be open to doing that for a small group. Can you comment on the 3D gun? Um, I don't know about that particular gun, but there is a uh, 3D printers now. You can buy plans um, and use your 3D printer to make a, a 3D printed gun, sometimes called a zip gun. A zip gun is just any homemade improvised gun. And the receiver and the action are going to be made out of plastic and the um, it'll usually be a single shot uh, break open action 
um, and it's a, a low quality gun that is easy to smuggle past a metal detector because it's um, almost entirely um, plastic parts. Uh, maybe the firing pin will be metal. Um, usually the barrel has to be metal, but if it's, there are ways that you can make them. If, if the plastic is thick enough and if the caliber is low enough, then the entire barrel can be plastic as well. Could you also call a zip gun a ghost gun? I've never heard of a ghost gun. I don't know. Um, zip gun is sort of an old term from the 70s for um, guns that were made out of the antennas of cars found in, in junkyards used by gangs, sometimes uh, uh, improvised in prison, uh, in workshops and prisons. Marco, what about uh, guns getting jammed? Can you share just a little bit about how that works? Jump, guns getting jammed? Yeah, yeah, we hear that a lot. Sure, um, sure. A a gun getting jammed means that you fired a shot, and then rather than reloading in a new cartridge and being ready to fire again, something gets stuck, and often it's. Um, because the cartridge didn't come, the empty cartridge or the spent brass didn't come out completely. It came out partially and then it got jammed up against uh, one of the sliding mechanisms. And so you have to pull the, um, pull the slide back and sometimes take a pair of pliers and pull the spent cartridge out and throw it away so that a new one can feed back in. Um, a jam can happen because of fouling. Fouling means that you've been shooting a lot and you haven't cleaned it and all of the gunk and the, the partially burned gunpowder starts to um, make the mechanism sticky. And rather than operating smoothly, um, things start to, to get uh, stuck inside the action. And so um, when you're in the military, they teach you to, to field strip and clean your weapons on a regular basis so that they, they won't jam. Um, but sometimes uh, jamming is because the, the casing is bent or um, some uh, part of the slide, like the extractor, the extractor is a little hook that grabs the empty cartridge and pulls it out and tosses it out after each um, shot. And if the extractor is, um, is bent, uh, it might get stuck and not pull the cartridge out entirely. And so when uh, in law enforcement or in the military or in the shooting sports, when you're learning how to um, operate a weapon, part of it is how to clear jams, how to recognize a jam and how to clear it safely and make sure that while you're clearing the jam, you don't accidentally shoot your foot off. I thought a ghost gun was a gun without a serial number. Maybe so. I've just never heard that term. Ghost gun is made out of 80% lower. Huh. Okay. What causes a backfire? Um, I'm not sure, Richard. Um, a backfire? like a backfire. I think that was a translation for le salió el tiro por la culata, which is actually not a, a real thing that happens in a, in a handgun. Uh, but it used to happen in, in, back in the 1800s where the, the shot might, might get jammed and, the, uh, and that hurt the shooter. Huh. Miguel is a mechanical engineer, so he's the one to ask about these things. <laughs> I was going to be a mechanical engineer for a couple of years, and then I was like, this sucks. I'm going to study Spanish instead. <laughs> so I, I made it up through my sophomore year. <laughs> Miguel actually finished. 